Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vic Amar, and I am the Dean of the College of Law here at the University of Illinois. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the 2015 Vaquetta DLA Piper Lecture Series on the role of government and the law, which for more than a decade has brought some of the nation's most distinguished leaders and thinkers to the University of Illinois to share their experience and wisdom about politics and world affairs. This lecture series is made possible through the generosity of College of Law alumnus Carl Vaquetta and his longtime law firm, DLA Piper, one of the world's largest and most prestigious. One of the things that drew me to Illinois uh, this summer when I came here to become dean was the remarkable talent and loyalty of the University of Illinois alumni base. Carl Vaquetta, with two degrees from the U of I, is the epitome of what it means to be an Illini. I don't think anyone in the world bleeds orange and blue more genuinely than he, and no one's life work showcases what one can accomplish with an Illinois education any better than his as well. Carl can literally be counted on always to help. He is a founding member of the John Cribbett Society, he was co-chair of the college's successful $50 million Brilliant Futures capital campaign, and he has established the Carl L. Vaquetta Chair in Law and the Carl L. Vaquetta Scholarship in Law. This is a special homecoming for Carl. He and his classmates are here celebrating their 50th reunion, and um, I'm delighted that we have so many people from the class of 65. That's a very special class uh, here with us this weekend. Uh, They are a devoted and a tight-knit group. Uh, several years ago, uh, Carl partnered with his classmates to establish the college's first class endowment gift. Uh, Carl, we've said it before, but it can never be said too much. We are tremendously grateful to you for your vision, your generosity, your dedication to the College of Law, uh, and also to the steadfast support uh, that your firm has provided us. Um, I had the distinct pleasure to visit uh, Carl in, in the DLA Piper uh, offices last week, and uh, it, was, it was tremendously uh, enjoyable. As always, uh, we are delighted to have you back here, and also to welcome your cousins, Tom and Norma Jenkins, if they're in the audience. There we are. Nice to see you. And I would like to take just a minute to um, acknowledge several other special guests we have with us today. Uh, one is uh, Timothy Colleen, the University of Illinois president, um, joining us. <laughs> College of Law alumni Dave Downey, class of 1966, and Jane Hayes, class of 1979, are both here with us. I've, I've had the good fortune to spend a little time with both of them, and I look forward to more of that. Uh, and Paul Ulanop and his wife, Ginny. Paul's a member of the class of 1961, and he, here, he too is here. Is he here for the lecture today? Maybe not yet. Um, I also want to extend a, a virtual welcome to those who are joining us via teleconference, video conference by DLA Piper offices across the world. I understand that more than 20 offices in Canada and Europe uh, are connected to us. And when I was in uh, DC last week visiting Carl, um, he showed me um, literally with the enthusiasm of a child on Christmas morning, which is one of the, the most wonderful things about Carl for anyone who's ever met him will know, uh, showed me and my assistant uh, dean for advancement, Chris Higgins, how technologically advanced DLA Piper's uh, office was. Uh, and we were thoroughly impressed. And uh, with a building update project that we hope to finish before too long here, we aspire to that same kind of, of connectivity. Um, let me mention a couple of other guests before we uh, 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 turn to the main event. Um, we have uh, the state treasurer, uh, Michael Frerix here. Um, he uh, was here in a class earlier, and he, uh, I think, is sticking around for some of the day. And then one of our uh, distinguished alums, uh, Judge Deb Walker, is also joining us today. So we are very happy to have that. 
Homecoming is a great opportunity to welcome back so many members of the college community. So it is quite fitting that today we welcome back to Illinois uh, Ray LaHood, uh, who was last here at the college in 2009. Uh, he was the invited speaker for convocation. A native of Peoria, uh, a place where I have not yet uh, uh, visited, but uh, I'm going to go there next week, and I really look forward to that. Um, Mr. LaHood ha had a 36-year career in public service. In 1994, he was elected uh, from Illinois' 18th Congressional District to the United States House of Representatives, where he served on the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and the House Appropriations Committee. There, he developed a strong reputation for his skills as a fair-minded broker of sensible compromise, promoting bipartisan cooperation and fairness. He was the presiding officer of more debates than any other member of the House, including the uh, kind of predictably um, uh, uh, contentious debate over the impeach impeachment of President Clinton. In 2008, President Barack Obama announced uh, uh, Mr. LaHood's nomination as the 16th Secretary of Transportation, and he was confirmed by the Senate to that position in 2009. Secretary LaHood's tenure at uh, the Department of Transportation was marked by wide-scale strategic efforts to improve safety in every mode of transportation, as well as a continued emphasis on identifying and keeping hold of common policy ground. In these regards, he was a key, key player in putting together and bringing to legislative fruition the White House's economic stimulus package um, uh, after 2008. One of his particular passions as secretary was what he called a crusade against distracted driving. Due in part to his efforts, almost a dozen states and Washington, D.C. now prohibit handheld cell phone use in the car and text messaging as well is banned in 39 states and DC. Uh, it's a big challenge and I must admit that in years past I sometimes uh, fell prey to wanting to whittle in down my inbox. Um, but the country is meaningfully safer because of the Secretary's tireless work along these lines. Not many people can go to sleep rightly feeling that they've saved large numbers of lives, so I think that's a really noteworthy thing. On the topic of today's remarks, bipartisanship, President Obama observed about Secretary LaHood, quote, years ago we were drawn together by a shared belief that those of us in public service owe an allegiance not to party or faction, but to the people we were elected to represent. As our nation and state leaders struggle more and more desperately to locate common ground to actually do anything, and one need look no further than Illinois or Washington DC these days to see the challenges that are presented, I am pleased today that we have someone with us uh, whose message and whose track record offers hope and perhaps a bit of a roadmap out of the wilderness. So one thing I would encourage is for all of you in the room to let other people who can't be here today uh, know that they'll be able to view and listen to the Secretary's remarks on our website. And I would encourage us to give this talk as wide uh, a distribution as we can. So with that, let me turn it over to the Secretary. Well, good, good noontime to all of you. Thank you for, for coming, Mr. President. Thank you for taking time out of what I know is a very busy, busy, busy homecoming schedule uh, to uh, be here at this lecture. And uh, when I was a young boy growing up in Peoria, uh, one of, I loved basketball and I loved uh, watching uh, Dave Downey play basketball. And so, Dave, t to have you here is a great honor uh, for me. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a Bradley Brave uh, alum and a Bradley Brave fan, and, uh, but uh, Dave was truly one of the most outstanding basketball players ever to play in, in our part of uh, central Illinois. Uh, and to my wonderful, wonderful friend, uh, Carl Vaquetta, I just want to say thank you. Over maybe a year ago, Carl invited me to participate in this lecture. And as I look back on the other speakers that you've had, uh, I feel honored uh, to have been invited here. Um, I met Carl when I 
uh, began uh, at uh, DLA Piper, and I can tell you that there's no one more respected, more revered, and uh, more of a gentleman uh, than Carl Vaquetta, and I know for the University of Illinois and a couple of other organizations, there is no one more generous uh, than Carl Vaquetta. And to all of you students who are sitting here, uh, he has set the highest bar and the gold standard for what alums should be doing uh, at the School of Law and for their university. So just a uh, uh, I know none of you have graduated, but and none of you are, have successful careers, but you will. So take your cues from Carl uh, when you get out there and uh, are successful. Carl, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk for a few minutes, and then I'm uh, happy to hear what any of you might want to talk about or, or, or hear about. I, on Monday... Uh, I'm going to be interviewed by Judy Woodruff of the uh, News Hour, and uh, she will be interviewing me about a book that will come out on Monday called B Bipartisanship, My Life in Politics, which I wrote with the head of the Dirksen Congressional Center, which is located in Pekin, Illinois. Uh, he and I authored this book, uh, and it really is about my time in Congress, uh, some of the issues that we dealt with. and. And then uh, my time as a Republican in a Democratic administration. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, bipartisanship. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what's not happening in Washington and why it's not happening. And then uh, really throw it open to uh, any of you that, uh, that might want to uh, jump into the, to the conversation. Uh, I'm the most, uh, and, and again, to the students that are here, thank you for coming. Uh, I know you have many opportunities to hear from many different people, and I want you to know that I'm the mo least likely person to, in my high school graduating class or my college graduating class from Bradley University, no one would have ever looked at my picture in the yearbook in my high school class or in my class at Bradley University and said Ray LaHood will be a member of Congress or the Secretary of Transportation. And I tell you that because you have no idea what roads you will travel. But if you do your best and work as hard as you can and get the best education, there are enormous opportunities in this great country of ours. There are enormous opportunities. And you are all mighty lucky. Uh, those of you that have graduated from the U of I have graduated from if not the finest university in the country, maybe in the world, certainly one of the finest. And for those of you that are students, this is a great university. And the potential that you have uh, is, is, is enormous. And I'm proof of it. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that having grown up in Peoria and graduated uh, from Bradley University, uh, that I'm the first alum to have ever served in a cabinet post uh, and I'm, I'm proud of that because um, I worked hard throughout my college days, and I worked hard on the idea that I wanted to be a school teacher. That's all I ever wanted to be. My teachers were my mentors, and so I taught school for six years, and as I was teaching young people the Constitution, I got interested in politics and government. And so I left teaching and, and worked for two congressmen, uh, one from the Moline area, Moline area of Illinois, and then obviously I worked for Bob Michael, who served in Congress for 38 years from the Peoria area. And then I had the great privilege of being elected in 1994. And if, if some of you are wondering what the term bipartisanship means, I'm going to explain it in this way. I served in Congress for 14 years. When I was elected in 94, Republicans had not controlled held any control, any con committee chairmanships for 40 years in the House, always controlled by Democrats. And when we were elected in 94, Republicans came into the majority, and a fellow by the name of Newt Gingrich became speaker. Very controversial, a lightning rod for controversy, very opinionated, and Bill Clinton was in the White House. And everybody thought that, boy, they're going to lock horns. 
two very smart individuals, two very strong-willed individuals. But during that period of time that Speaker Gingrich was Speaker and Bill Clinton was President, a lot of bipartisan legislation passed in Congress. Why? Because both men came to their jobs with the idea that government, people in government, people in responsible positions in government have a responsibility to get things done. And that simply is not the case today, and I'll get to that in a minute. But what we did from 95 through 2000, and then Speaker Gingrich left the speakership, and obviously President Clinton was term limited out of his time in office, we passed three balanced budgets, we passed welfare reform, we passed tax reform, and we passed two six-year transportation bills. All significant legislation. All legislation that solved big problems. Now, President Clinton vetoed two welfare bills because he didn't like them, but what happened? He and Gingrich got together and they talked. Republicans talked to Democrats and they worked things out. That has been the rich history of our country for 236 years. People working together, coming together, and in a bipartisan way, moving America forward. And, and many of us are proud of those days. Many of us, I served on the Transportation Committee. I was a part of passing two six-year bills. We haven't done that in Congress in a good long period of time. We haven't passed a balanced budget in a good long period of time. We haven't passed tax reform in a good long period of time. We know we need to fix a broken immigration system. And why can't we do it today? And here's the simple answer. The simple answer is there are 40 members of the Republican Party who call themselves Tea Party members in the House of Representatives that were elected on the idea that they don't really believe in government. They came to Washington to vote no on everything. They shut the government down last year. And that's the reason we're in the mess we're in. And there's about maybe five or six in the Senate who trash their leadership, criticize their leadership. That's why we're in a crisis in Washington. Because 40 people can stop any big kind of legislation, any solving of big problems from moving forward. And how do we change that? The way things always change in America, through elections. And I know there are people that say, oh, these districts were carved out for certain people and carved out for certain members of certain parties. But in the end, if the Republican majority in the House doesn't get their act together, these people are going to be thrown out of office. Remember I said we came into the majority in 1994? So from 95 to 2000, we were in the majority. What happened? Republicans got thrown out of office and Democrats took over because people want to make progress. The American people want progress. I come from a I came from a congressional district, 20 counties in central Illinois, once represented by Abraham Lincoln, one term only, once represented by Everett Dirksen. 50 years ago last year, Everett Dirksen, who came from Pekin, Illinois, was the Senate minority leader, worked with Lyndon Johnson, a liberal president, to pass the Civil Rights Bill. Now. Now, Everett Dirksen came from an all-white community, Pekin, Illinois. They used to have blue laws there that said blacks could not come to their community after 5 o'clock. What did he do? He moved the country forward. He helped Johnson solve problems as a conservative Republican. That's the definition of bipartisanship. Now, there's 100 members of the Senate and 435 in the House, and not one of them gets their own way. When you get elected to Congress, you have to find 218 people to support your idea to pass a bill into law. And then you have to get the Senate to do it. 
So how does, how does this really work? Sitting down, talking to one another, listening to one another, compromising. Compromise is not a bad word. It's not. Now, it may be a bad word among some Tea Party people, but it's not the way that our country has moved forward. It's not. Compromise is the way that we have, have really pushed things forward. And until we get back to that, we are not going to solve our immigration problem. We're not going to solve our infrastructure problem. We're not going to solve a very complicated tax code. We're not going to pass a balanced budget. No, I could use this analogy for our own state. Until our governor and legislative leaders sit together, talk together, work together, we're not going to have the kind of activity in Illinois where we get to a budget, where we fund the things that are critical. And remember what I said, not one person always gets their own way. And it does take this kind of compromise uh, to really make things happen. Now, a few other things that we did. I'm very proud of the fact that I co-chaired four bipartisan retreats. If you know somebody that you work with every day, it's a lot more difficult to trash them, to criticize them. It's much easier to talk to them. And so we, along with our friends on the other side of the aisle, on the Democratic side, co-sponsored some bipartisan retreats where we got members of Congress together. On a weekend, we went to Hershey, Pennsylvania. We ate all the chocolate that you can imagine. <laughs> sweetened everybody up. And people got to know one another. Our first bipartisan retreat, we had over 200 members of the House, over 150 spouses, and over 100 children. And what happened? Congressional kids got to know other congressional kids, spouses got to know other spouses, and members of Congress began to form friendships. When you form a friendship with someone, when you get to know someone, it makes it much easier than to begin the discussion and the deliberations and, ultimately, the compromise. And so we, we, we did that. That was helpful. That doesn't go on any longer. But the bottom line is you have to have people in positions that want to get things done, that want to make the wheels of government turn, that want to solve problems. And when you don't, it makes it very, very difficult. L let me just talk. I'm, I'm going to just shift gears here for a minute because this is something I know about and I think it's something that we need to talk about. Let me just talk about the state of infrastructure as one example. And the best way I can explain it is that America is one big pothole right now. <laughs> you all know that. You do. Why is it one big pothole? Because there's two crises in our country when it comes to infrastructure. First of all, there's no big six-year bill. There's no plan. Congress hasn't passed one for five years. So we need a big plan. We need to give certainty to engineers, to architects, to people that design roads, to contractors who build roads, to governors who have responsibility for transportation programs. They don't have that now. They don't. We're operating uh, on these short-term extensions where we slop a little money into the transportation, but there's no real long-term vision. So that's, uh, Congress needs to pass a six-year bill. And the other part of it is the Highway Trust Fund is broke. The big pot of money that build America is the Highway Trust Fund. When you buy a gallon of gasoline, part of, the, part of that goes in to the Highway Trust Fund. And so what did we do over the last 50 years? We built the interstate system, the best road system in the world, which is falling apart. We have hundreds of bridges that are deficient today. They're on a list at DOT that need to be repaired. We used to build bridges. Now we don't even repair them because there's no money to do it. And the pot of money that I call the big pot of money that build America the gas tax hasn't been raised since 1993, more than 20 years ago. Can you think of anything that hasn't gone up in 20 years? 
Nothing. So we need to raise the gas tax. Now people say, well, let's do tolling. Tolling's fine. Let's do public-private partnerships. We did a bunch of public-private partnerships when I was at DOT. That's fine. But in order to rebuild America, in order to rebuild the thousands of bridges that are falling down, we need a big pot of money. We need to replenish the highway trust fund, which has no money. We need to raise the gas tax at least 10 cents a gallon, index it to the cost of living, so that money is there every year, pass a six-year bill, and boom, we're back in the business of infrastructure. This money does not stay in Washington. Where does it go? It goes to the American people. It goes to pay people who build roads. It go, every time you build a roadway or a transit line or a light rail line or a streetcar line, what does it become? An economic engine. Because then, think of all the small businesses that are located along our interstate. Every one of those small businesses employs somebody. They wouldn't have been there if the roadway hadn't been built. So you build a bus line, a light rail line, a streetcar line, a roadway, what happens? Businesses begin to pop up all over the place that employ people. This is a win-win for America. Infrastructure is a win-win for our economy. We need the resources, and we need a plan, and we need a vision, and we need people in Washington with the courage to raise the gas tax which politicians don't want to do. 14 states in the last two years, 14, raised their own gas tax. Two very conservative states, Wyoming and Utah, controlled completely by Republicans, and not one politician was thrown out of office. So what I say to politicians in Washington, of which I used to be one, don't worry about being thrown out of office. If you raise the gas tax, that money comes back home. That puts friends and neighbors to work. That creates the kind of economic activity that really gives a boost to uh, communities all over America. And that's what we need to get back to. That's what, that's what America was known for. Roads, bridges, infrastructure. We have 50-year-old transit systems in all of our big cities. They need new cars, they need new infrastructure, they need new tracks, and they can't do it without the resources. And we need to go back to the resources that, that really build America. So that's um, my definition of bipartisanship. And look, look, and I'm not one of those that says we need to go back to the good old days, but we need to look at how We've become successful in America. And the legislative process requires people working together across party lines, talking to one another, compromising with one another. And when that happens, we make a lot of progress. And remember, no one person gets their own way. But in the end, we solve big problems and we make progress. And that's really what I think the American people want. Let me just say one final word. I, I got acquainted with Barack Obama when he was a U.S. Senator and I was a U.S. Congressman. He and I had never met when he was a Senator, State Senator, and I was a Congressman. Our paths never crossed. When he was elected to the Senate, he called, a week after he was elected to the Senate, he called my cell phone and said, Ray, I'm coming to Peoria. I'd like to sit down and talk to you about how we can work together. And for two years, while he was a senator and I served in the House, we worked together in a bipartisan way for Illinois. No partisanship. And we became friends. I also became friends with Rahm Emanuel. He was a congressman from Chicago. I'm a congressman from Peoria. But we worked together for Illinois to make things happen for our state and for the people. And we made progress. So Rahm and I were friends, the President and I were friends, and after President Obama got elected, he was looking for a Republican or two uh, to serve in his cabinet. And they offered me what I considered an opportunity of a lifetime, to serve in what I believe is the most historic administration with an African-American president in the history of our country. And I love public service. 
So I accepted the position. And I think some Republicans in my district, I had already no announced that I was not going to run for re-election, that I wasn't going to serve any more time in Congress after 14 years. And the President offered me an extraordinary opportunity. And because of my friendship with President Obama and Rahm Emanuel, I thought it was a great opportunity to serve America. Not to serve a party, but to serve America. Party had nothing to do with it. Although I don't think I would have gotten the job had I been a Democrat, <laughs> since they were looking for a Republican and I had been elected as a Republican. And I'm still a Republican today, but I'm also a proud American. Proud that I've served my country in a bipartisan way, in a way that reflects the way that America has solved its big problems. And I hope that uh, that message will resonate particularly with uh, the young people that are uh, here today, that uh, we, we can continue to make progress, uh, but we have to do it in a way that reflects the values of our country, that we have strong differences, and you don't have to give up on your principles, but you put the country first. And you put the problems of the country first, and that's the way we solve problems. Carl, thank you for inviting me, and thanks to all of you for being here, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. We have about uh, 20 minutes. And we'll start with that gentleman in the pink shirt there. Uh, thank you. I just, first of all, I want to say I'm from Peoria, so you were my congressman. So. What's your name? Uh, Brad Barber. And Did I'm you like your representation? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wasn't able to vote, so I never voted you oh, out. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but my question for you is, uh, one of the criticisms of the primary process is that it produces extremist candidates because um, generally there's not as much voter turnout and the turnout is generally extremist voters. Do you think we should have a reform of the primary system or, or what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, l l the question is, should we reform the primary system in Illinois uh, and it re you know, the truth is it doesn't make any difference. It's not going to happen. The two, <laughs> and here's why. The two-party system is very strong in Illinois. And, and some of you know that uh, my oldest son, Darren, w has just been elected to Congress. And he went through a tough primary against what, against a Tea Party candidate. And he won. And so your premise is that under our primary system, the so-called extremist, and I don't want to characterize his opponent as an extremist, but he was a Tea Party candidate and very proud of it. And obviously, Darren uh, ran as a conservative candidate, but, you know, not as a Tea Party candidate. He ran as a Republican. And um, so, you know, I think he proved that if you run the right campaign and talk about the issues and let people know your positions that you can win against a, a Tea Party person in Illinois. And we're not going to change the primary system because the two-party system is just so strong in Illinois. I know people like the idea of maybe an open primary where you can walk in and vote for, you know, if you want to vote for Darren LaHood and then vote for a, a Democrat and kind of go back and forth. It's not going to happen in Illinois. Um, should it happen? Um, it, you know, it's a good concept. It really is. And uh, it gives people a lot more flexibility. There are some people that don't want to claim what they are. So they don't vote in a primary. They don't want to tell people if they're a Democrat or Republican. And so that's the reason we have very low turnouts in primaries sometimes. But um, it's, uh, it's more of an idealistic way of looking at things. Practically speaking, I just don't see it happening. There's a question. Uh, we can go back there, and then there's a gentleman down here. Uh, that uh, fellow there. Uh, well, first off, I'd like to thank you for coming and talking to us again. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know everyone else does. Um, my question for you is sort of, there hasn't been a long-term or more than two years transportation funding bill passed since 2005, and from my point of view, I know I'm young. Um, since then, every time a funding bill comes up or a short-term extension is passed, it's the three months or the two years, the polarization that we have, it's always a fighting point, is the transportation bill. It's always a grandstanding technique, and my question for you is, why the transportation bill? Why is that the 
the funding bill that's picked for riders or to, to sort of hammer home your point? Yeah, you know, in the old days, we, we had the money to fund trans six-year bills. And the reason it's a big fight now and the reason they do these three months extensions, which they're going to do here very soon, the current extension runs out very soon, is because we don't have the money. And frankly, we don't have politicians in Washington that are willing to step up and say, let's raise the gas tax. Let's get that big pot of money. If there was the money to fund a transportation bill, boom, it would pass very quickly. But the money is simply not there. And nobody has the vision, courage, whatever term you want to use, to say, OK, you know, if the Speaker of the House or one of the leaders said, or even the president said, OK, we've got to raise the gas tax. We've got to get moving here. We've got to get some money in this bill. I think they would pass a six-year bill. Actually, in the Senate, they passed a six-year bill, but only funded three years. The House just passed, uh, this, the committee passed a six-year bill yesterday. No funding. Nobody's willing to address it. What I say is go to the legislators in Wyoming or Utah, two of the most conservative states in the country, and take your cues from them. Do something. Raise the tax. We need a big pot of money. And the reason it's contentious is because there's no money to fund a long-term bill. And until they come up with the money, we're not going to have a long-term bill. And our country is going to continue to crumble. The largest segment of unemployment in America today is in the building trades, people that build roads and bridges. The states simply don't have the money. Uh, this gentleman and then this, uh, the judge. Yeah, well, thank you for your service, first of all. We appreciate it. And I love your approach and bipartisanship. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, whether this has any effect on bipartisanship or not, I don't know. But what's your position on term limits? Well, I voted for term limits. But look, a term limits is, is not the answer. Look, we term limit the president. And, you know, I served for 14 years. You can only do so much in these jobs. Some people stay too long. Um, you, you know, I, I voted for term limits. But, you know, it, it, it's not the, the end-all, be-all. It's, you know, it, it, it is what it is. And, you know, if it makes you f people feel good that you're term limiting somebody, you know, that's fine. Um, that, that was, you know, part of the thing that we voted on early on when I first came to Congress. And, um, you know. So but you don't think it would give them an incentive to compromise if they know they're not facing a re-election? Well, they have term limits in states, some states. We don't have it in Illinois. But they have term limits in California where uh, in, in the assembly you can only serve six years. And, uh, um you know, I, look, look, you have to elect people who want to get things done. That's what you have to do. You have to elect people who believe in government. You have to elect people who believe in the system they're running for. Politics is the only job that I know where you get people running against the job, trashing the job. <laughs> I've never, I have... My daughter and son-in-law are doctors. I've, I've never heard them trash medicine. They love their jobs. I have a daughter that's a teacher. She doesn't trash education. But when you run for office and you trash Congress and you trash government employees, what's the purpose? That when you get in there, boom, you don't do anything. You're ineffective. You don't even believe in the job you're running for. It's nonsense. So, you know, term limits are fine, but, you know, that's, that's not, and, it, it, you know, term limits aren't going to happen. How long do you think Illinois can function without a budget in place? And do you think it was a judicial error for the judges um, to allow a state employees to be paid while there is no budget? Well, look, at I, I, I say this. Um, I travel around the country, and I spend a little bit of time in Washington, D.C., and I still have a home in Peoria. Um, 
we had a change in, in leadership in Illinois for one reason and one reason only. Our state is a mess. It really is. And people wanted a change. And that's what Governor Rauner ran on. And so this idea that, you know, he's holding up the state budget, he's doing it because that's what he ran on. He ran on certain things, and I think he's going to try and hold the legislators' feet to the fire on some of these things, and we'll see what happens. But they need to sit together and talk together and work together for the people of Illinois. And he may have to give up on some of his things, and Madigan and Cullerton may have to give up on some of their things. Uh, but um, I don't know enough about the other uh, question to know about, you know, uh, the judicial decision that was made about state employees. I mean, the state of Illinois is a large employer, right? All of the judges are paid by the state of Illinois, for example, and a lot of other state employees. And if there had been the pressure of people who were not being paid to apply, but uh, my understanding is that a huge percentage of the state uh, expenses are being paid. So the lack of a budget doesn't have that great of an impact on day-to-day -day people. Who would yeah, be you know, it really pressure. does, though. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of people that work in, uh, uh, there are a lot of nursing homes, a lot of uh, health care, there are a lot of people that have received uh, state services that have not been paid. There are huge, huge bills piling up. And um, th th look, this is just not the way to, to, to run our state, but I think Governor Rauner feels like he ran on certain things, and part of it was to clean up the budget mess, part of it was pension reform, and until some of those issues can be dealt with, I think uh, it, it, it's, it's a difficult time for the people of Illinois. Um, how about this gentleman here? Mr. Secretary, thank you for coming, and Mr. Vaquetta, thank you for bringing the Secretary to the University of Illinois. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned factions and how that's splintering the democratic process and preventing any deals from getting done. Recently, Paul Ryan mentioned the fact that he would consider uh, running for the uh, Speaker of the House position if something analogous to a unity pledge was, uh, I guess, adhered to by the Republican Party. Do you think that that's merely lip service or political posturing, or do you think that that's an effective tool to um, manifest compromise? Well, he, he asked that the primarily the, the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party unify behind him. And some of them said that they would unify, but they didn't get to the 80% threshold that would allow for an endorsement of his candidacy but he has said that he's going to run for speaker. So he's going to, there are going to be a bunch of headaches that he's going to face uh, as a result of these folks. Uh, if they don't like what he's doing, you know, they're, they're going to cause him a lot of headaches. Um, I, I, you know, look, at he, I think he didn't want to face the same thing that Boehner was facing. And, um, and the Tea Party, some of their requests had to do with, you know, having a seat at the table, having part of the decision be that they have some say in it, have some opinion on it. And um, I think he assured them that they would have seats at the table, that their opinions would be heard. And, uh, but l l let me just, let me give you one example of how this works. Maybe about two or three years ago when there was a budget stalemate and the Tea Party would, would, would not vote on keeping the government open and would not vote on appropriation bills, they went to Speaker Boehner and they said, let us vote, let us have the amendments that we want to fix uh, the budget and to fix appropriation bills. They got all the amendments they wanted on a particular bill. Anybody that wanted to offer an amendment could. And some of their amendments were voted in, some were voted out. In the end, they all voted against the bill. So, you know, the point is, my point, they're not there to make progress, to move things along. They're there to throw sand in the gears of government, to grind them to a halt. And that was proof of it. So Paul Ryan's going to have headaches from these people. How do you stop the vilification? Pardon me? How do you stop the vilification? Then? It's called elections. 
electing people who believe in the job they're elected to, electing people who believe in the system that they're elected to, electing people who want, want to move forward, want to make progress. I really believe this. I believe the same thing will happen to the Republican Party if they don't get some things done over the next year that happened to us when we were in the majority. The people are going to throw them out. I don't care what districts they come from. Uh, that gentleman there. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, with many young law students in the audience, what would you recommend we do outside of elections to represent your message and advocate for bipartisanship? You need to get involved. Now look, at I know you're all busy, and I know you're all trying to get through law school, but uh, we need people to get involved. We need people to participate. And this is a great time in our country to do that. We, we have no incumbent president running. We have candidates on both sides. So you could get in involved at the presidential level. We have a U.S. Senate race in Illinois. Senator Kirk is up for re-election. We have every, con every member of Congress running for re-election. You have every member of the Illinois House running for re-election. We don't have our statewide offices up this time. Involvement is very, very important. It really is. You've got to get involved in the process. And uh, that, that, that's my recommendation. And uh, you learn a lot, you meet a lot of people, and you really, you know, figure out who the, the right people are that you want to serve the state or, or the country. First, I'd like to thank you for um, everything you've done to move the state and this country forward. Um, my question is, do you think that the way the state of money in politics and campaign finance plays a role in the gridlock in Washington and maybe even... Yes, you know, and I should really include that in my speech. I, I mean, I look at I, I've... Money plays way, has way, way, way too much influence. And the Supreme Court decision on super PACs where multi, multi wealthy people can accumulate contributions, never disclose who the money is from, spend it any way they want it. These multi, you know, millionaire people, um, money plays, uh, particularly on, at, at the presidential and the congressional level, way too much. I mean, I, I was just stunned when I read the article where Governor Rauner spent $37 million of his own money to get elected governor in 2014. And, um, but it, money, money plays too big a part and the Supreme Court, I think, made a very bad decision by allowing all of this to take place at the national level. Do you think it would uh, take a constitutional amendment? I do think it would take a constitutional amendment to get the attention of the Supreme Court. And considering the gridlock in Washington right now, would that be feasible? To I think happen? a lot of, look, at I do think there is a consensus among people who serve in Congress and serve in Washington that this kind of money has too much influence, and, um, but nobody has really introduced a constitutional amendment to correct it. But I think there is a consensus building. This gentleman here, thank you for asking that question, and I need to really talk about that more, because I think it's a very good point. Yes, sir. Mr. Secretary, I'm not a defender of the Tea Party by any means, but we've seen, regardless of party, Republican or Democrat, there's one goal of both parties, and that's to spend more, more entitlements. We saw it under the Bushes, we saw it under Reagan, and most of the Democrats. But for these 40 uh, Tea Partiers, people like them, uh, who in Congress is gonna address the, the uh, concept of $18 trillion deficit with no future for our young people? Who's gonna stop the spending if not these so-called radicals? And by the way, Roosevelt was considered a radical because he suggested Social Security. Uh, Martin Luther King was considered a radical. Uh, Gloria Steinem was a radical in their time. They then became mainstream. Thank God in America we we're allowed to have radicals uh, because we wouldn't get anywhere. So I challenge your premise a little bit uh, because we don't see any end to the spending but for people like these people who are speaking up, whether they like government or not. Look, at I, I go back to what I said before. <coughs> I served in Congress when we had Speaker Gingrich and Bill Clinton 
and we passed three balanced budgets. Now, we didn't shut the government down, but the two of them sat down and figured out, and you know who was a big part of that? John Kasich. He was the chairman of the budget committee. Can, these, can our problems be solved in what I would call the old-fashioned way? By people talking to one another and working together and believing that the process will ultimately work? We proved that it did. We passed welfare reform after it was vetoed twice by Clinton. We passed three balanced budgets. We passed tax reform. And we did it the old-fashioned way. The way that all of you do in solving problems every day in your community, on the church board, the library board, the school board, think of the boards that you're on. Do you agree with everybody that's on those boards? No, of course not. So what do you do? You talk to one another. You work it out. You compromise. Shutting down the government is not an answer to solving our budget problems. It's not. It's very hurtful and very harmful, not only to our economy and the people who live in America, but to our image in the world, that we can't get our act together. And so my answer is, use the process where people talk to one another, work with one another, and compromise. And I, the other point I would make is this, the point I just made. The Tea Party people have these demands, and so you meet their demands, and, and what do they do? They go a different direction. They're never going to be willing uh, to move forward. And can we solve our fiscal problems? Yes, we have before. Can we get to a balanced budget? Yes, we have before. Can we do immigration reform? Yes, we did it before. Can we get tax reform? Yes, we did it before. How did we do it? By electing people who want to come together and solve problems the way the American people do it every day in their own communities. They do it. They do it the old-fashioned way. They sit around a table and talk to one another and get things done. Are you standing up because we're done? Carl has one last one. Carl's got a question. Carl gets the last one. He's the sponsor. That's the way it works. Uh, if you're willing to tell us, on the Republican side, uh, who are you supporting and who do you think will get the nomination? Uh, I'm supporting Jeb Bush because I think um, he's a, you know, he was a very good governor, made a lot of reforms in his state. Um, and, um, you know, I think, uh, I think he has a skill. But I like John Kasich, too. I think John has been a good governor. I think he'd be a good nominee. And, um, you know, I, I, I think if the party were to nominate somebody like Trump, then I think we hand the election to, to Hillary Clinton. I think we need a substantial nominee, somebody who's made a difference, somebody who can really get things done, has proven that they've been able to get things done. And I think it's pretty clear that Hillary will be the Democratic nominee, and it's not clear at all who the Republican nominee will be. But... Um, it needs to be somebody who can put up a good fight against a, what I believe will be a very, very substantial nominee in Hillary Clinton. They've been through it many times. And um, so that I, I think, uh, but I, I think we've got some good candidates. I think the Republicans do. Substantial candidates, and uh, they're all working hard, and it's... Uh, it's a tough slog out there. Good luck to all of you. Thank you.